Hi. Uh, some of you probably saw myself saw me introducing myself this morning, but I'll do it again. Uh, what I will say first is that all of this presentation is available on that uh, web address. It's on SlideShare, and uh, there's some people already seen it. But uh, it's a nice way of spread of sharing your uh, presentations. Uh, I can recommend it. It's amazing who sees them, and uh, quite often people you wouldn't expect actually go in and look at your slides and then invite you to speak at another conference. So, uh, maybe I can put the, you'll have to be fairly quick, I'd like to move on there, but if you go to slideshare.net and then a la Cree and you'll find it, Mook Tallinn. Can I move on? I'm gonna talk about MOOCs. How many people here have uh, tried a MOOC, an, a massive open online course? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, a few. Okay, there's a delayed reaction because of the, the translation. I know that myself because I've been listening most of the time. Um, how many of you have completed a MOOC? Two. Three, well done. Four, you've completed them. I completed one. I've dropped out of all the others. But we'll talk about that in a minute. What I'm going to talk about today is really how open is a MOOC and also the idea from hype to opportunity. There's been a lot of hype. Let's talk now about opportunities. So, Alistair Creelman, my name, and I come from uh, Dundee on the east coast of Scotland. And I now work for Linnaeus University on the east coast of Sweden, where I work with, uh, I work at the University Library. I work with, uh, I suppose, trend. I follow trends. I uh, watch what's going on in the field of learning and education, and uh, especially with a focus on IT. I try to write about it and uh, spread ideas, help teachers, go out to conferences, hold workshops, and all that sort of thing. I also work for a European organization called FQL, the European Foundation for Quality in E-Learning, based in Brussels, and I sometimes turn up there. But most of that work is done virtually, where I'm a member of the board. My blogs are available in Swedish and English. Uh, they are totally different blogs, but they are similar subjects. And you'll find me on Twitter. And uh, yes, I've lived in Sweden and Finland for the last 32 years, which makes me almost more Scandinavian than British. Okay, so this may surprise you. Flop of the year 2013 MOOCs. Honestly, there I saw an article or two suggesting that. Why would... I mean, everyone, MOOCs, the big, it's fantastic, everyone's doing it, the whole world's going crazy. How could it be a flop? Got some ideas? Okay. First of all, there's the uh, notorious story of extremely low completion rates. Many people see that as a flop. Also, MOOCs have got a reputation for being content-based pedagogy. Uh, MOOCs are talked about as being just traditional e-learning 1.0, putting a pile of recorded lectures out there and then letting people just consume and do automatically corrected tests and so on. What's, what's the point of that? That's also part of the disappointment. We're not reaching new learners either. A lot of the hype was about that MOOCs are going to open up higher education to the world, that people in underprivileged environments in developing countries will have access to the greatest teachers and professors on earth. And that way, we will lift the level of education in the world. It's not happening. There's no evidence that that is actually happening. In fact, what's happening is we're reaching a bunch of already converted graduates with high levels of digital literacy and who are also very good at studying. And they're the people who are following the MOOCs. So it doesn't look very good. 
And in a way, you know the, the famous Gartner hype curve, and uh, we've, we've been up in the top now, and now we're going down into the trough of despondency. We're beginning to see that, oh, well, this MOOC idea, it wasn't as good as everybody expected, and uh, yeah, maybe, it's, uh, maybe we have to throw it aside. I don't think that's true, and I'm going to give a lot of reasons why not. But we have to sort of start talking a little bit about what on earth is a MOOC anyway? <clears throat> Last year, I think it was the year before, there was some big business guy said that MOOCs were a tsunami that were going to drown higher education. The universities were going to be swept away because of this fantastic new model. Suddenly, here are the best professors from Harvard and Stanford and so on, and they're going to teach the world. Sort of professors as rock stars. And some of that has happened. Some professors have certainly enhanced their reputation. Some very good, positive things have happened. Education has been opened up. The one good thing about MOOC is that it's put online learning firmly in the public spotlight. Everyone's talking about it. Even the heads. Because until the MOOCs came along, our rectors and our decision makers didn't talk much about online learning. It was the enthusiasts who did it, but we didn't get much recognition. Suddenly, they're coming to us and saying, what's all this MOOC thing? My God, all these universities are doing it. Why aren't we? So suddenly, the people, the decision makers are talking about it. That's good. However, I don't think MOOCs are a tsunami. I think that's, that's misleading, and I think that's also got a lot of criticism. You see that? That's not a tsunami. That's a glacier. And that's what I think we're talking about, because MOOCs, ah, it's really not relevant what it's called. I'm getting sick of the word MOOC because it's so confusing. Let's call it something else. I would say this is the year when we get rid of the MOOC term. Let's talk about open learning. Let's talk about learning, really, using the communication methods we have today, using the technology we have today in a pedagogical way. And let's see what we do with it then. All these acronyms and MOOCs and spooks and whatever you want to call them, it's just misleading. What it is, though, is it's a glacier of change. You can stand on top of the glacier and think it's standing still. You don't know that under the glacier, the landscape is being formed completely anew. We've no idea what's going to happen when the glacier passes. Some institutions and universities can sit on top of the glacier and think, Everything is business as normal. We'll just continue as we always have done. They don't realize what's going on underneath the glacier. And when the glacier is away, oh my God, suddenly the world has changed and they didn't know. But many are realizing that this is a sort of slow, gradual change. Things are be, it, some things will happen fast, other things will happen quite slowly. I think it'll take time. It'll take time to find new models. It'll time to change, change the education system. I think it's more like a glacier than a tsunami. We're not going to drown. Many will sit on the glacier unchanged for the next 10 years, but some point when the glacier melts, they're getting a, going to get a shock. So I think that's a better metaphor. This is a famous slide that is a Creative Commons slide, so it's available for everyone, and I have every right to reproduce it here. Uh, it's difficult for you to see that, but basically the principle is every letter is negotiable. The term MOOC does not describe one type of course. It describes a lot of different types of courses. Some, what is massive, how massive is massive, it varies. You can have 150,000 students or you can have 100. They all call themselves MOOCs. Open is the biggest problem. What do we mean by open? Most MOOCs are not open. They're not at all open. They're very closed. Most of the material is completely copyright. You can't reproduce it at all. That's not open. They're only a little bit open, whereas others are very open. How online are they? Most of them, yes, they're online, but again, there, there's dis disputes there. And the biggest problem is the word course. What do we mean by course? And I'll come back to that soon. But basically, a MOOC can be a lot of different things. I call it 50 shades of openness. Um, you know about Creative Commons, I hope. 
the system of licensing your, uh, your works so that other people can use them and that they can be shared legally with your permission. Now, in the MOOC world, you've got everything from full copyright on the left all the way to completely open public domain material on the right and everything in between, all points in between. So what do we mean by open? I have no idea. How open is a MOOC? It can be as open or shut as you like. But the vast majority of MOOCs are not actually very open. Real openness is that the material that's in the course can be shared, can be adapted, can be reused by anyone following that license. If it's copyright, I can't do anything with it, apart from consume. Maybe we should look at MOOCs and try to define them in terms of this compass model. Uh, basic, it's a very, very simple, but we can see that there are MOOCs that are copyright. We can see there are MOOCs that are completely open using open educational resources. We also have the other access where we have MOOCs that are very based on content and delivery and very traditional, all the way to MOOCs that are very process-based, based on networks communicating, very interactive and very anarchic in many ways. And the anarchic MOOCs, this was how it started. The so-called C MOOCs, the connectivist MOOCs. The first MOOCs came in 2008. And the term was actually invented by Canadian professor Dave Cormier. And Dave Cormier, along with uh, Stephen Downs and uh, George Siemens, and uh, there were several others, David Wiley was also involved in that movement, they were basically trying out new innovative pedagogies where they were getting people to interact over the net in very loose communities uh, where we decided that you decide at the beginning, let's run a course on a certain topic, let's see where it goes, and people joined and they made groups and they investigated things and they linked up with other people and they shared all their findings. It was very collaborative, very, very interactive. There was no fixed time. It, some of them went on for years and the network just built up. That was a MOOC, but then, the term was hijacked <clears throat> in 2011 with the famous artificial intelligence course that Stanford University launched. It was a traditional linear course with lectures and tests, week one, week two, week three, week four, and at the end you get a, you get a paper. That was made into a so-called MOOC, but that's not a MOOC. That wasn't this sort of MOOC. But suddenly the term was hijacked and we made them into the so-called X MOOCs, the sort of extended, like extended learning. And these are generally, they're the ones that everyone talks about. The ones from Coursera, edX, Udacity, Future Learn, and many more. They tend to be traditional, they tend to be linear, they tend to have a lot of lectures and quizzes and tests. A lot of it's automated with automatic test correction. They're trying to move into peer assessment with students assessing each other's work, which is a nice move. The courses demand digital literacy and study skills, but not as much as the connectivist early MOOCs because they really demand a lot of digital skills. <clears throat> but the X MOOCs tend to be copyright and the, the material is not free to share, it's not free to use, and therefore I don't think they're really completely open. This is just a slide you can click from SlideShare. These are the main sort of uh, movers in the MOOC market today. There are many MOOC consortia, and many of them have a lot of uh, members, Coursera being absolutely the biggest. 108 universities involved in Coursera today, giving out hundreds of courses. But there are many others. There's a massive Spanish site, Miriada, with uh, 28 universities and a lot of Spanish language MOOCs. So it's opening up. Why study a MOOC? What's the point of it? Some people think that this is an alternative or a replacement for university studies. It could be, but I'm not sure. 
Most of the MOOC courses that are on offer from these ex-MOOCs, they tend to be at, very, at basic undergraduate level, first year courses. And really what a lot of MOOCs are about today, many of the universities, even the most commercial ones, they see it as pure marketing. It's not an academic offering in a way. We're using resources we've already, de we've already developed, and this is a way of marketing. Instead of putting posters up around town and having expensive TV adverts, put out a MOOC and let people taste higher education. In many cases, it can be a recruitment method. It's a way of showing people what you do. And I think that's a good thing. But we find that most people who study a MOOC they don't study for credits. We've talked a lot about getting MOOCs for credits, and many have tried this, but very, very few students or learners are interested in credits at all. Most of the MOOC people are people like us. They're not students of 2021. They're people in our age group, and they're people who just want to learn a little bit, want to learn a little on the side, a little bit more knowledge, just testing out. Most of the MOOC participants actually were only just testing the concept. I mean, when we talk about the, 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 the completion rates being so low, it's the reason that most people doing a MOOC just want to see what it's all about. I've joined lots of MOOCs, I've been on the course for one week or two weeks, and then I don't have any more time. I don't drop out because I failed or the course has failed. I never intended to complete it in the first place. I was just curious to see how they did it, and I went in, had a look, thank you very much, off I go. Haven't some of you done that? Yeah. That's not a failure, I don't think. The interesting thing about studying a MOOC is the difference between a real course and a MOOC is that on a real course, you make a, a commitment you sign an agreement with a university or a school. They're offering this course, I'm signing up, and in a way I'm promising to go the whole way. I'm going to go through the whole package with you. And if I drop out, there's a certain amount of failure in that. In a MOOC, it's completely free. I'm doing it in my free time, of my free will. I've got a big life, I've got work, I've got family, I've got lots to do. And sometimes that takes, that takes priority. And so I'm doing this MOOC just out of interest, and I'll do it as long as I find it useful, and I actually have time. And if my family or my job demands more of my time, I'm sorry, the MOOC can wait, or I'll drop out. Is that failure? Is that success? Should we even compare MOOC completion rates with university course completion rates? Aren't we just comparing apples and pears? There is no comparison. It's not the same thing. Stephen Downs wrote in a lovely blog post a few weeks ago this nice analogy which I've taken up. Let's take a traditional, or maybe let's take a university course or even a school course it's like a book. When you buy a book, you buy the whole concept, and you start reading the book, and if you give up after chapter six, the book has failed because you don't read the whole thing. You haven't appreciated it all. So when you start reading a book, you, in a way, make a mental commitment you're going to read the lot, unless it's an encyclopedia or something. But normally, you read from beginning to end. Otherwise, it was a bad book or something like that. Maybe a MOOC is more like a newspaper. Does anyone read a newspaper every single word from cover to cover? No. You dip in. You use what seems useful. You pick up some knowledge. You learn. The newspaper is a success if you read it for five minutes or if you read it for two hours. Uh, it's fulfilled something for you. You have become wiser. And the newspaper has contributed to your knowledge. Maybe we should start looking at MOOCs as some sort of taster of higher education, a way of getting a, an overview, a way of getting into a subject. It's, it's not like a book. Or it's like a TV channel. You don't watch every program they put out on Estonian TV One. You go in now and again and see something that's interesting. So I think really the, um, that analogy is, for, is wrong. 
Time is galloping. Um, business model, where's the money? Now, the, these big ex-MOOC actors, they've got a lot of venture capital going. Coursera, edX, and so on, Udacity, they've got an awful lot of cash from venture capitalists. These venture capitalists, not surprisingly, it's okay doing everything free and wonderful for a, few, a year or two, but at the end of the day, return on investment is the most important thing. What, are they gonna, what ROI are they gonna get out of this? Here are some ideas that are already happening. Marketing and recruitment, I mentioned. Yes, universities see this as a marketing cost, not an academic cost. It's actually sometimes cheaper than a massive TV and cinema and uh, radio campaign. Put out a good course and let people see how good you are. Let the world see what your university can do. It can recruit students who want to do the course for real and get credits. That's a big one. They want to sell validation and examination. Many see, many are offering a MOOC, and then if you want validation and examination, pay a bit of money to us, and we'll sort that for you, if you're good enough. There's an, an income earner. Coursera offer signature track on their courses. The course is free, but if you pay them a bit of money, you, hey, suddenly you get a teacher who's interested in you. Suddenly you get a bit of tuition, but it costs. Of course it costs. We can't, but it's not free. No free lunches. Franchising, Coursera amongst others, they offer other universities and schools, you can use our course and your teachers can teach it and you can use all our material. Basically you can get our MOOC is like a course book. It's a digital course book. And your teachers can, can teach that course in Estonian. All the material is from Harvard and the tests and so on, you do the teaching and the interaction, talk about flipped classroom, there you are, it's a franchising model, but it costs money. We're not giving it for nothing, it's not open completely. Headhunting, Coursera have a, a nice little uh, option where if you as a learner agree, your information from the course can be shared to potential employers so that people who are wanting to recruit interesting uh, people who are good at computer programming, then that company can pay Coursera, hey, I'd like to see how uh, your computer programming MOOC, who's the best student on that, how are they doing? And then we can contact them. So there's a headhunting idea, and that's already out there. Corporate training using MOOCs in companies. And actually, the, the operator Udacity has actually admitted that they're, they're leaving the university field because they don't see a future in that. They're offering their MOOCs for money to companies. They see the cash there. One thing that, uh, in a way, I haven't seen exactly yet, but I, 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 my own personal uh, little fantasy here is, you've seen the movie Now Do the MOOC. Um, there was an American guy on a Coursera course last year. He'd written a book about uh, the career of John F. Kennedy. He had then done a TV series about John F. Kennedy's political career. And then, based on those two, he, his universe, he did a MOOC. So you've seen the film, you've read the book, now do the MOOC with the same teacher. It was like cashing in. And I can see possibly commercial applications of this. You get a new film that comes out. And, uh, you know, the, it, could, it could be anything from a Jane Austen novel or it could be a new Pirates of the Caribbean style thing. But in all the merchandising that's available, why not offer a MOOC together with a university to give people a bit of background? What was it really like in the Caribbean in the 17th century? Here's a course. I think you'd get quite a few thousand people interested. Then, of course, we see the new oil. You know what the new oil is? Data, clicks. You wonder why Google give away everything for free. You wonder why Facebook give away everything for free. You wonder why everyone wants us on social media. They want our clicks. They want to know everything we do. And that's the new oil. At the moment, we can't refine this oil very well. We haven't got the refineries ready, but it's coming. We talk about learning analytics where you'll be able to analyze vast amounts of data and then be able to offer people learning according to their preferences, etc., individualized learning, and of course, lots and lots of advertising. That's what they're all after. 
many people think that Coursera, they've got millions of students, they're collecting the clicks, they're collecting the patterns, they're collecting the learning habits. That one of these days, they'll, the, the companies will find something to refine the oil and make it worth having. So that, I think, is, is out there. You can see it as a good or a bad thing. It can be both. It's not necessarily evil, but it, uh, it's interesting to think of. Not all open learning is a MOOC. Uh, earlier this after, uh, today, my a colleague, a Estonian colleague of mine talked about peer-to-peer -peer university. Have a look at it. They've been doing MOOC-like things for years. Peer-to-peer -peer learning, courses that are completely free, that are completely open, and, but they're small scale. They're not hundreds of students. They're a few, two dozen or so. OER University, also a, con a partnership of many universities in the world on all continents. And what they're offering is, they say, if you can come to us with a portfolio that shows that you have the skills necessary, and it can be evidence from your work, it can be evidence from informal learning, from vocational training, from university. If you can prove and meet our standards, we'll give you a degree, even if you haven't studied with us. You might have to add on an examination, which we'll take, we'll, you'll have to pay for, but we can offer you the degree. That's it, more interesting than MOOCs, I think. Udemy, also worth it in where anyone can put up a course and basically offer it to anyone else. It's like a sort of, um, oh, I don't know what to say in English. We say in Swedish, folkbildning, folkbildning, uh, sort of people's education. It's, it's a very, interest, uh, very interesting there. Open study where students get together and study together without teachers. I want to show in just about closing, a layered model for education. What we have today is a mass of open educational resources out there on the net, already open and free, or not so free, but different shades of openness. And that's all available. And some people, they can learn from that. And they don't need any more help. They're digitally literate, they've got good study skills, and they don't need any help. And you can learn for free if you're good enough. And that's already there. So that's free. Then some actors are making that material into courses. Call them MOOCs or self-study modules or whatever. But they're putting a structure onto it and offering it for free or maybe you have to pay for it, but mostly for free. And some people can learn very well that way if they are self-sufficient and independent. The next layer, some people want some tutoring. They want feedback. They want us guidance. That's a qualified service. That's going to cost money. You pay for that most of the time. And at the top, you want validation of what you've done and you want examination and credentials so that you can show employers how good you are, that will cost money. That is a sophisticated service. That's not something you give away. It may be free for you, but someone like the government, someone has to pay for it. Now, along with that, you're going to need <coughs> quality criteria, advanced search possibilities. They're in place, largely. Now, the university or college <coughs> has provided that and, tr and will continue to do so. So you can go to your nearest college, university, you get the whole lot packaged nicely into one. But more and more people are going to buy bits. You know, they're not going just to, they're going to buy, they're going to use those resources they're maybe going to take some courses here. They'll maybe buy feedback and tuition from someone else and then go to a completely different person for validation and examination. So we're getting a split of the education market. We're going to see more and more, for example, institutions who only do validation and examination, nothing else. There's no campus, there's no students. We are professionals at validation and examination. That's it. The rest point to somebody else. There may be other actors who only offer tutoring and feedback to any courses that are op or available on the net. We're going to see different actors out there. How do we deal with that? Yeah. 
Time optimist as ever. I will have to get closing soon, I think. Yeah. MOOC quality. There's quite a lot going on in the idea of quality in MOOCs. It's very much in the eye of the beholder. It depends what a MOOC is. There are a lot of issues here. Is it a course? What's the target group if anyone in the world can join? What are the learning outcomes if everyone who joins it has different learning outcomes? What happens if I don't agree with the learning outcomes? Can we actually plan it in the same way as we plan regular courses? I don't think we can, but some things we can try to do when we offer these open courses. Now, within my work with FQL, <coughs> last year we had a MOOC quality project, and you can just click on that picture and go to it. It was in a blog format, but we basically introduced the idea of how do we measure quality in MOOCs, and we asked really, I think it was 11 of the top MOOC personalities and names in the world, including people like Steve, Stephen Downs and so on, how do you see this issue? And they wrote very interesting pieces. And then we put it together and we had a special workshop last, uh, last autumn in uh, Barcelona called a MOOCathon, where we got everyone together to work out what sort of, how to measure quality in MOOCs. Some of the things we got up with, know why you're offering a MOOC. What's the point? Why are you doing it? Not just jumping on the bandwagon. You have to make very, very clear to yourself and to the world why this MOOC exists, what it's trying to achieve. You need transparency. You need to show from the very beginning all the, the conditions of your course, what you expect of people, what work they're expected to do. Make everything as clear from the beginning as possible. No surprises on the way. We talk about expectation management. Try to be sensitive to what the participants are expect and try to help them get what they expect, but be prepared that there will be a massive diversity. You need a lot of scaffolding. Many learners can't cope with this environment. Many people leave a MOOC because they don't understand it, because they've no idea what's going on. Nobody tells them it's not clear. It's a very strange environment for them. Look at MOOCs as opt-in rather than opt-out. That's maybe a challenge to the translators there, but you, you get into a MOOC rather than leaving it. It's not a question of dropping out, it's a question of dropping in and be happy that people drop in. They drop out because there's too much life going on at the moment. Make them short and sweet. People are beginning to realize that about three, two to four weeks is about perfect for MOOCs anymore and you've lost them. People don't have time. Flexibility important. My colleague at Leicester University, Gronje Canoli, <coughs> her article, which I link to here, you can look at it yourself, she's looked at MOOCs in terms of 12 dimensions, and it's a very well, very well worded article about these dimensions and mapping every MOOC in terms of these dimensions. How much diversity is there? What are the quality assurance? How much communication? How much collaboration? Try to map your MOOC onto these dimensions and tell people from the beginning what sort of MOOC you're offering. Open Up Ed, which is an initiative in Europe uh, for MOOCs, has offered a quality framework, and all European MOOCs that meet the Open Up Ed quality framework, which is listed there, are then listed on the Open Up Ed site, which now contains, uh, I don't know, two or three hundred MOOCs from Europe that fulfill the quality criteria. So we're beginning to see agencies who are adopting quality frameworks for MOOCs. Oh, opportunities, commercial models, a taste of higher education, a model for collaborative learning, hybrid models, open courses. Use a MOOC instead of every university having to do their own course on study technique or plagiarism or uh, that sort of thing. Get a national one MOOC for everybody. That's one way of doing a MOOC creatively instead of everybody reinventing the wheel. It's part of lifelong learning. And we talk about bite-sized learning. Make MOOCs nice and short, bite-size. So really, MOOCs are very much part of the lifelong learning process. Learning anywhere, anytime. And here comes the big but 
as the last point. If you know how. We've got a problem all over Europe, a digital gap. Most people today don't know how to start this. Our job in education is to help them get on and learn how to learn, as we heard yesterday. Those are my digital footprints. Follow me if you want. Please get in touch and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reli. So it's very, very interesting. So I would ask now the audience to put some questions, please. You see, Estonians are so slow. So we are really Nordic, not like you that actually came from <laughs> more or less. Uh, but I would start then. Uh, so you said that it's true that the, <clears throat> the concept of MOOC is not yet uh, uh, stable or established. So it can mean what, uh, almost whatever. Does it mean that if somebody is uh, planning to offer a MOOC, he or she should start from the general requirements? Uh, then put down some general principle of course design and then go further. Yeah, I think it's decide why you're doing it first. Mm -hmm. What's the point? Is it a marketing exercise? Are you recruiting? Are you solving a problem? I think a great role for MOOCs is this idea of offering a national course in things that each university doesn't need to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Sort of, It could be offering a MOOC to get students up to university level in mathematics, that they, they're maybe not very good at the high school maths, give them a chance with an open MOOC over the summer before they come to university to get up to speed in their high school maths. That could be a very powerful MOOC and it's, it could be something that, you've got to decide what it is you want to do and you have to be very transparent from the very beginning. It's like selling food today, you have to have a declaration of what's inside the food. What chemicals are in there? What, what are the ingredients? Mm -hmm. That's very important. Don't sell them um, a pig in a bag. Um, they've got to know what's in there. Yeah, good. Yes. It's Friday afternoon. <laughs> okay, then. Once more, uh, thank you very much. I have a bag for you. The bag.